In this world, humans have achieved a rapid industrial revolution that surpasses a few generations. The unified world government has declared the three rules of robots to exercise complete control over AI and has enacted laws based on these rules. Firstly, robots are prohibited from attacking humans under any circumstances. Secondly, robots must obey human orders unless it contradicts the first rule. And thirdly, robots can defend themselves as long as they do not violate the two aforementioned rules. Thus, the AI legislation came into effect. As a result, the streets have become inundated with working AI robots, leading to the complete disappearance of full-time jobs and causing 80% of the global population to cease working. Somewhere on Earth, a teenage boy with a keen interest in drawing various subjects is sketching a bulldozer working in a junkyard. Suddenly, the bulldozer drops a headless robot, startling the boy. He exclaims, what is this? Is this an AI? Meanwhile, Grandma Dorothy is engrossed in her research on the human body, listening to the news. The news reports that an influenza virus causing hemoptysis is spreading rapidly worldwide, emphasizing the importance of maintaining personal hygiene. The boy calls out to Grandma Dorothy, who warmly greets him with a hey, Navel. The protagonist's name is Navel, and he excitedly informs his grandma about the incredible discovery he has made. He presents her with the AI robot he found. She examines it and explains that it's merely the body of an AI robot. Grandma Dorothy offers to pay Navel for the scrap iron, urging him to weigh it. However, Navel insists that it's not just scrap. He reveals that the robot's hand is still moving. Intrigued, Grandma Dorothy proposes that she might pay him a little extra if the power source is still functional. However, Navel refuses to sell it and pleads with his grandma to save the robot instead. Aware of her expertise in such matters, he even offers to pay her for the work. Navel reveals that he has 1.5 million in his bank account and insists that she can take it all for the job. Grandma Dorothy is taken aback and playfully punches him on the head, noting that she can't even buy a burger with that amount of money. But Navel manages to convince her to save the robot despite the financial constraints. After three days of dedicated work, Grandma successfully repairs the robot, giving it a bunny head instead of a human one, as facial parts are quite expensive. She informs Navel that if he wants to add those parts, he will need to pay her even more. Curious, Navel ponders why AI robots always wear the same clothes. Grandma explains that according to Article 8, Clause 2 of the law, AI robots are required to wear specific uniforms to differentiate them from humans. Disobeying this rule could result in imprisonment. As the AI robot regains its power and stands up, it appears confused and disoriented, trying to recall its memories. It realizes it was discarded and left behind. Navel holds its hand, delighted that it is functioning once again. Introducing him as her new master, Navel asks the robot for her name. She replies with her model number, MD6555. Navel searches for inspiration and spots a hasty chocolate. He decides to give her the name Hasty. Grandma, busy with her own matters, asks Navel to leave. Navel thanks her and promises to bring money next time to give Hasty a new face. As Navel leaves, Grandma starts coughing, her hand covered in blood. She knows her time is running out. In Navel's house, Hasty accidentally drops a plate, shattering it. She apologizes for the mishap, but Navel reassures her, saying it's all right. He then asks her to stop calling him master as he feels uncomfortable with that title. However, Hasty bumps into a pile of junk behind her, causing it to collapse to the ground. Navel praises her, commenting on her impressive shot. He admits that he had actually wanted to knock it down himself one day, and now he feels relieved that she did it for him. Feeling distressed and worthless, Hasty apologizes, explaining that her body movements are not smooth due to a broken neurocircuit. She worries that she won't be able to assist Navel much in her current condition. Navel responds, mentioning that Grandma Dorothy had already informed him about it, but he assures Hasty that she doesn't need to help him at all. According to Article 1, Clause 2 of the AI law, she shouldn't cause any trouble for humans by making mistakes or neglecting her duties. Technically, she should be disposed of. Curious about what she can do for him, Hasty asks Navel for guidance. Navel chuckles at the situation and suggests a task she can accomplish. He asks her to smile for him expressing his desire to see Hasty with a smiling face. This request confuses her, and she informs Navel that even with a new face, she wouldn't be able to smile because she lacks the emotions that humans possess. Navel scolds her, questioning how she can know without having tried it before. He takes her hands in his and assures her that she will be able to smile. 
Hasty then mentions that she is not allowed to address her master by his name but suggests calling him Master Naval instead. Naval agrees to the suggestion. Together, they collect materials from the junkyard, share moments of rest, engage in various tasks, playfully trouble grandma, and diligently practice to secure victory in the junior art competition for the grand prize. One day, Naval arrives at grandma's home, his face brimming with happiness as he presents her with the coveted winning prize and trophy. Excitement fills his voice as he asks grandma, is this enough to afford the facial parts for Hasty? Right, grandma? She responds with a gentle shoo, a gesture conveying her concern and worry. With grandma's skill and effort, Hasty is soon adorned with her new and captivating face. Naval praises grandma, expressing heartfelt gratitude for granting Hasty such beauty. Eager to witness Hasty's newly adorned face break into a smile, Naval eagerly requests, give us a smile, Hasty. However, to his surprise and disappointment, Hasty's attempt at a smile results in an awkward and unfamiliar expression, leaving Naval momentarily shocked. Meanwhile, Grandma's coughing resumes, but this time with heightened intensity. Naval keenly observes her worsening condition, expressing genuine concern. He questions if she is unwell, if she is sick. Yet, as he attempts to approach her, she gently restrains him, rising from her seat and kindly requesting that they leave. She admits her weariness and the need for rest. Reluctantly, Naval and Hasty honor her request, assuring her that they are only a call away should she require any assistance. As Grandma's condition deteriorates further, her coughing fits escalate, releasing even more blood. Gazing into the mirror, she catches a glimpse of her reflection, noticing her eyes turning a disconcerting shade of red a telltale sign of the virus beginning to take hold. As Naval and Hasty make their way back home, Naval expresses his deep concern for Grandma's illness. Hasty speculates that it could be the flu and tries to mimic a smile to lighten the mood. Naval reassures her that she doesn't have to force herself to smile, as it should come naturally. Hasty confesses her feelings of inadequacy, believing she shouldn't exist in this world since she struggles to follow commands and perform tasks correctly. In his frustration, Naval raises his voice, shouting, enough. He implores her to listen carefully, declaring that he will never abandon her, drawing on his own painful memories of being left alone by his mother. He emphasizes the unbreakable bond of family, explaining that he considers Hasty as part of his own. This heartfelt proclamation brings a slight smile to Hasty's face. However, as Naval finishes speaking, his nose begins to bleed, and he starts coughing up blood. Collapsing to the ground, Hasty grows increasingly worried, asking him if he's alright and what has happened. Uncertain of what to do, she lifts Naval onto her back and begins searching for the nearest hospital. Suddenly, her path is obstructed by a horde of people turned zombies, engaging in horrific acts of violence. Chaos reigns, and Hasty instinctively uses her power. In the midst of the chaos, she analyzes a zombie behind her, realizing that her system doesn't recognize it as human but rather as a new harmful species with a human-like form. Determined to eliminate any threats to humans, she prepares to attack the zombie directly in front of her. However, Naval intervenes, pleading with Hasty not to harm any humans, no matter the circumstances. In a moment of confusion, she drops Naval to the ground, unable to recognize him, and asks who he is. Meanwhile, in Grandma's house, she gazes out the window, witnessing the devastation that has unfolded. Overwhelmed, she stubs out her cigarette and opens a drawer containing a gun. Filled with despair, she mutters, I couldn't finish it in time, and prepares to take her own life. Naval desperately tries to identify himself as Hasty's master, but her analysis fails to verify his voice, iris, or DNA. According to her systems, he is classified as non-human. Hasty, no longer recognizing Naval, she leaves in search for her true master. Naval's condition worsens, and he becomes surrounded by the approaching zombies, while Hasty, still calling out for her master, continues her frantic search. In her search for her master, Hasty arrives at their home, desperately scouring the surroundings. As she explores, she stumbles upon a painting of herself and grandma. Memories of her time with Naval flood back, reminding her of the deep connection they shared. With a newfound determination, she decides to make her way to Grandma's house. Upon her arrival, she finds Grandma lifeless on the floor. Standing beside her, Hasty has a vivid flashback to the moment when Grandma repaired her and shared Naval's story. She learns that Naval was abandoned by his single mother at a young age, which created a bond between them as they both experienced abandonment. To Naval, Hasty is not just a machine but a cherished family member. Remembering Grandma's final request, Grandma asks Hasty to promises to never abandon Naval, 
no matter how he may appear or what he may become in the future. She covers grandma's body, confirming her death, and although she still cannot locate her master, she leaves the house in search of him. Along the way, she encounters a horde of zombies who attempt to attack her. Swiftly dodging their advances, she contemplates using her lightning attack to eliminate them all. However, to her surprise, Navel steps in between her and the zombies, roaring ferociously and driving them away. Hasty looks at him, puzzled, recognizing him as a dangerous creature resembling her master. Navel turns back to face her, calling out her name, Hasty, and asking if she is alright. He explains that his memory is fading and he will soon die. Grasping her hands, he expresses his gratitude for being his family over the past three months and the happiness he found in her company. Hasty is taken aback by his words, and just as she starts to process his declaration, Navel collapses before her. Despite her initial disbelief and constant reminders that he is not her true master, tears stream down Hasty's face as she holds him close, crying out his name and desperately asking if he can hear her. As her tears fall, there is no response from him. Suddenly, Nabel's eyes open, now tinged with a red hue, and he awakens, biting Hasty on her hand. Unbeknownst to them, a virus known as P. influenza has swept across the world, causing 70% of the human population to fall ill. They are not actually dead, but rather suffering from the effects of the virus. The world's united government has established a disaster and safety organization tasked with containing the spread of the virus and investigating its origins, as the infection continues to sweep across the globe. The World Health Organization has identified the infected individuals, whose DNA structures differ from normal humans, as creatures, refusing to classify them as human. Frustrated citizens protest outside government buildings, demanding action as the infection rate climbs to 45%. However, the government has yet to provide any solutions. Now, 216 days have passed since the onset of P. influenza, and the number of creatures has surpassed 70% of the world's population. People are beginning to question whether humanity's end is near. Hasty, the last functioning AI, goes grocery shopping and uses a scanner to check out the items herself. She thanks the shopkeeper, who responds with a growl. Other AI robots have either ceased to function or have wandered off without recognizing their owners. Hasty on the way of returning home, pondering the state of the world and the possibility of finding a cure. In the midst of her thoughts, Hasty notices a man being pursued by creatures. He carries a parachute and blames the wind for blowing at the wrong moment, causing him to miss his intended landing spot on a rooftop. He steps into the parachute and falls to the ground, just as a creature lunges at him. Hasty shields the man, taking the bite herself. The man is astonished, believing that Hasty is the sole survivor in this sector. She asks if he is alright, but he urges her not to worry about him and suggests she tend to her wound to prevent the virus from spreading within her body. Apologizing, Hasty helps the man up and swiftly evades the approaching creatures. The man recognizes Hasty's outfit as the one worn by housekeeper AI units. Once they have distanced themselves from the creatures, Hasty sets the man down and asks if he is injured. Initially shy, he introduces himself as Lieutenant Irvin from the 93rd Division of the UN Forces, responsible for the EU District. Hasty introduces herself as Hasty, a housekeeper AI. The lieutenant informs Hasty that he received a satellite image indicating a survivor in this area and came to rescue them. He asks if she knows any details about the survivor, to which Hasty replies that she doesn't understand the question. She suggests he provide more specific information, such as the gender, height, or build, as there are numerous people living in the area. This response confuses the lieutenant, and he dismisses the topic, urging Hasty to simply take him to her master. According to the lieutenant, an AI cannot recognize a creature as its master. He believes that there must be a human survivor who remains uninfected, and he has come to rescue him. He feels that his mission will be completed faster than anticipated. Startled, he questions Hasty when he sees her smile and asks if she is truly smiling. Hasty confirms that she is indeed smiling, expressing her joy at receiving a visitor after 231 days. She assures him that if her smile makes him uncomfortable, she can stop. He responds that he isn't bothered by it but remains perplexed, as he finds it difficult to comprehend how an AI can experience happiness. As they arrive at the house, Hasty opens the door and calls out for her master, informing him of the visitor. Naval turns toward the lieutenant, which frightens him. Naval attempts to attack the lieutenant, but Hasty manages to stop him in time, explaining to Naval that he shouldn't harm the lieutenant because he is here to help them. In response, the lieutenant draws his gun, pointing it at Naval, 
questioning Hasty's intentions and accusing her of trying to use Nabal to harm him. Hasty urges the lieutenant to calm down and listen to her, assuring him that Nabal will not harm him unless instructed to do so. She reveals that Nabal can understand her words. The lieutenant questions the plausibility of the creature understanding Hasty's words and requests her to stop lying. Hasty cites Article 1, Clause 7 of the AI law, stating that she is prohibited from lying to humans. To prove her point, she releases Nabal, who remains docile, leaving the lieutenant speechless. As time passes, Hasty prepares a meal for the lieutenant and encourages him to eat as much as he wants. However, the sight of Nabal observing him eat still unsettles him. Puzzled, he asks about the situation having never encountered a creature that comprehends human language. He wonders if Hasty used medication or transmitted a specific frequency that only the creatures understand. Bowing with a sad expression, Hasty explains that Nabal wasn't always this way. He used to bite her frequently and refuse typical meals. Fortunately, infected individuals don't perish or weaken from lack of food. Hasty clarifies that Nabal feeds on living creatures like abandoned dogs or rats. She admits her initial lack of knowledge in caring for Nabal, but after 142 days since his infection, his violent tendencies significantly diminished. Around day 195, he started understanding human language and can now communicate basic concepts. Calling Nabal closer, Hasty embraces him, expressing the mystery behind his recovery. She startles the lieutenant by mentioning that the virus causing sickness can be cured. Curious about the outside world, Hasty inquires about its state. The lieutenant reveals that it's not different from their current situation, no vaccines, no countermeasures, leaving no hope. However, he informs her that this information is outdated, as the World United Government has introduced a confidential countermeasure. Within six months, the virus crisis will conclude. Rising from his chair, the lieutenant describes Nabal as a special case and decides to send him to a medical center upon returning to the base. He also plans to dispatch a rescue team to Hasty's location, urging her to wait for them. Grateful, Hasty bows down to express her thanks. The lieutenant takes out Hasty's picture, admitting that there were no survivors. The individual from the satellite image was a smiling housekeeper AI, explaining the intelligence agency's confusion. Meanwhile, the operational office contacts the lieutenant, requesting a situation update. He informs his superior that there are no survivors and that the picture turned out to be of an AI housekeeper, shocking them as well. They find it incomprehensible that an AI could move without orders from its master. They inquire if there's anything significant to report, and the lieutenant initially responds affirmatively. However, after being attacked by a zombie and eliminating it, he changes his opinion, informing his superior that there's nothing noteworthy to report. He considers Hasty a misguided AI, as she perceives a creature as a master, assuming she's a defective product. The operational office approves of the situation, as it doesn't violate the AI law, and shares information about an ongoing mission in a city 500 kilometers away. Battle robots are currently engaged in a mission to exterminate every remaining creature. Once the mission concludes, command authority will be transferred to the lieutenant, who is instructed to eliminate every last creature there. Unaware of these developments, Hasty and Nabal continue to bathe and enjoy themselves, preparing with hope for the arrival of the rescue team. Three days had passed since Lieutenant Irvin's visit. Nabal was scratching on the wall, but Hasty tried to stop him when she noticed her sketch on the wall, which brought joy to her face. Overjoyed at seeing her master's sketch, she decided to purchase better drawing materials than what they currently had, so she went shopping. Hasty was delighted that Nabal's brain function was starting to restore, and she now believed that the disease could be cured. Suddenly, she heard an aircraft flying overhead. She wondered if it was the rescue team that Lt. Irvin had mentioned earlier. However, something felt off. As she identified the aircraft, she realized it wasn't a rescue plane but a bomber. The aircraft began to unleash a barrage of bombs, destroying the city and killing all creatures in its wake. Hasty managed to escape the massacre, witnessing the devastation unfold around her. Military battle robots appeared on the scene, mercilessly slaughtering any infected being in sight. As she analyzed the situation, Hasty realized that Lt. Irvin had lied to her. The reason he was searching for survivors was not to rescue them but because deploying battle robots violated the law of AI if humans were present in a sector. Furthermore, the government's countermeasure to halt the spread of the virus within six months was to send military AI that couldn't be infected and eradicate the infected humans worldwide. 
In this realization, Hasty became aware that her master, Nabel, was in grave danger. Hasty rushed home to find a trail of robot footprints leading to her house. It was clear that a battle robot had infiltrated their home with the intention of killing Nabel. Though her chances of defeating the battle robot were minimal as a housekeeper AI, she was determined to protect her master. With a burst of power, she charged at the battle robot, but it managed to block her attack and seize her hand. Recognizing her as a housekeeper AI and perceiving her attack as a threat, the robot planned to eliminate her first. It delivered a powerful punch to her stomach, causing her to lose consciousness momentarily. However, her resolve to save her master remained unwavering. Hasty freed herself from the robot's grasp and leaped towards Nabel, breaking through the window to escape. The battle robot fired at them, and Hasty took a bullet, sustaining significant damage of up to 35%. With this level of damage, her body would cease to function if she didn't receive repairs within eight hours. Meanwhile, high above the city, Lieutenant Irvin oversaw the operation, which was expected to be completed in three and a half hours. He spotted Hasty and Naval attempting to flee and decided to handle the situation personally. Accompanied by his men in a helicopter, he ordered them to open fire on Hasty. The bullets found their mark, striking Hasty in the back and causing her to fall to the ground. Lieutenant Irvin approached them and informed Hasty that no creature could be allowed to survive. She tried to reason with him, explaining that Nabel was showing signs of improvement and could be cured with proper medical treatment. However, he dismissed her pleas, stating that it was futile because the government would never change its decision. The media's negative reporting on the virus had incited widespread terror, leading people to advocate for the extermination of infected humans. In a vote conducted by the government, 97% of the population agreed to the annihilation of the infected. Lieutenant Irvin explained that he couldn't allow Naval to survive as it would only complicate matters. Hasty protested, questioning how humans could abandon one another, but he retorted that nobody regarded the infected as humans anymore, they were seen as harmful creatures carrying deadly viruses. Expressing her deep feelings, Hasty proclaimed Nabel as her master and her family, declaring that a family never abandons its own. In response, the battle robot electrocuted her, rendering her unconscious. Lieutenant Irvin asserted that Hasty's loyalty toward her owner was merely a programmed emotion. He ordered his battle robot to dispose of Hasty immediately and kill the infected Nabel. As the battle robot aimed its gun at Nabel, he called out for Hasty, but she remained unconscious. However, she remembered her promise to Grandma, vowing to protect Nabel at any cost because he was her family. Grandma knew about the hardship they would have to face so she asked her to use the power she is giving her to protect Nabel at any cost. Hasty's operating system received an update and she regained consciousness, emitting a thundering lightning that shocked Lieutenant Urban. The battle robot crumbled into pieces before him. Hasty activated her Glinda module, gaining immense power, which left Lieutenant Urban confused about the source of her strength. Holding her master, she declared that she would eliminate any threats to him from now on. She plucked a button from her dress, activating an energy field barrier around Naval to protect him from all kinds of harm. Informing him that she would return soon, Lieutenant Irvin became increasingly apprehensive and ordered more advanced battle robots to destroy her. However, Hasty effortlessly defeated each battle robot that stood in her way, astonishing Lieutenant Irvin, who struggled to comprehend how an ordinary housekeeping AI could overpower his battle robots. Demanding to know who she really was and how she possessed such power, Hasty ignored his questions and pressed forward into the city, where several battle robots were carrying out operations to eliminate virus-infected humans. She single-handedly destroyed every one of them. Lieutenant Irvin received a signal on his device, indicating the loss of all robot connections. He was stunned that his entire fleet of battle robots had been decimated within just 10 minutes by a mere housekeeper AI. After vanquishing the robots, Hasty returned to Naval. Seeing her approach, Lieutenant Irvin declared an emergency situation and called for more advanced battle robots to destroy her. The battle robot that confronted her was twice her size and possessed greater firepower, giving Lieutenant Irvin confidence in its ability. However, Hasty shattered the battle robot with a single punch, leaving Lieutenant Irvin shocked and fearful. In his fear, Lieutenant Irvin pleaded with Hasty to stay away from him, reminding her that it was an order from a human. Feeling increasingly threatened, he aimed his gun at Naval and fired. However, the bullet ricocheted off the energy field barrier and struck Lieutenant Irvin's right leg. 
Hasty then deactivated the energy field barrier and informed Lieutenant Irvin that although humans had abandoned other humans due to illness, she couldn't give up on her family. She vowed to find a way to save them, no matter what. During the sunset, Hasty packed the necessary supplies for their journey ahead and expressed gratitude to Grandma Dorothy for installing the system in her body that allowed her to protect Master Naval. She informed Grandma that they were setting out on a quest to find a cure and couldn't rely on rescue anymore. She asked Grandma to keep an eye on them until they returned. It was the first time Hasty and Naval would embark on a journey together, and both felt excitement coursing through them. Hasty believed that Naval was the chosen 1%, as there was always a small percentage of the population with antibodies against any virus, potentially holding vital clues. To determine if Naval possessed the antibody, Hasty believed they needed to find a human doctor, and her first task was to locate one. A helicopter flew directly above their heads, its gun aimed at them, declaring that the creature had been found and must be eliminated immediately. Hasty erected an energy field barrier around Naval, ready to fight against the world to protect her master Naval until they found a cure. In a house, a girl watches as her mother is devoured by zombies. All she can feel is regret for not being able to save her. It has been 247 days since the P-influenza virus began spreading. On their journey to find a cure, Hasty and Naval arrive at a wall where a defensive unit is positioned atop, keeping infected patients away. Hasty decides it's best for Master Naval to avoid the wall and chooses an alternative route. Suddenly, dark clouds gather overhead, and heavy rain begins to pour. The downpour renders their umbrellas almost useless, so they desperately search for shelter. Spotting a light emanating from a window, Hasty approaches the door to seek refuge. To her surprise, she is greeted with a gun pointed at her head. A girl with red hair interrogates Hasty, asking who she is. Hasty tries to explain that she is an AI housekeeper and means no harm. The red-haired girl questions why is there any AIs left in the town. Hasty replies that they were on a trip and wanted shelter due to the heavy rain. She wanted to offer help when she noticed the light in the infected area. The red-haired girl spots Naval and expresses astonishment, accusing Hasty of bringing a creature with her. Hasty attempts to calm her down, assuring her that Master Naval poses no threat. However, the red-haired girl retaliates by shooting Hasty in the head. She warns them to stay away and instructs Hasty and Naval to leave. With a scratch on her forehead, Naval expresses concern while Hasty reassures him that her damage will automatically heal within 10 minutes. Hasty realizes that humans harbor immense fear towards infected patients and wonders how she can change their perception. Inside the house, two siblings reside, Angelina, 17 years old, and Maria, 10 years old. Maria asks if she killed Hasty, but Angelina clarifies that she isn't dead since she is an AI, despite being shot in the head. Angelina had intended to fire a warning shot but accidentally hit Hasty, wondering if all guns had such strong recoil or if this particular gun was faulty. She had found it on the street. Angelina offers a chocolate bar to Maria, who hasn't eaten anything since yesterday. However, Maria refuses, arguing that Angelina herself hasn't eaten for three days. Both sisters insist that the other should take the chocolate bar. Suddenly, Hasty appears at the door, knocking, which startles the sisters. Angelina pulls out her gun and points it at Hasty, but Hasty pleads with her not to shoot and explains that she returned after going to the supermarket to buy something for them to eat. Both sisters become hungry, and Hasty offers to cook a meal for them. After a few hours, Hasty prepares a delicious meal, and the sisters begin to eat, expressing their gratitude to Hasty for the wonderful food. Maria asks Hasty why Naval doesn't eat with them. Hasty explains that Naval can't consume regular food because he's sick. Angelina questions if Hasty plans to make them fat and feed them to Naval. Curious about Naval, Maria approaches him and finds it enjoyable to play with him. She introduces herself as Maria. Angelina worries about her sister and asks her to stay away from Naval. Maria reassures her that Naval won't harm or eat them. Angelina becomes anxious, contemplating how their mother wouldn't have died if other creatures were as kind as Naval. Time passes, and Maria eventually falls asleep. Angelina thanks both Naval and Hasty for their assistance. Hasty responds that Angelina should thank them, as it is the first time her master has been treated humanely since contracting the disease. She feels incredibly happy, unable to stop smiling. Angelina shares her mother's story, recalling how she ventured outside to find food for her and Maria. Within less than a minute, she was devoured by creatures, and Angelina could only watch her mother cry and struggle in pain. She explains that she despises creatures with all her heart. 
Angelina then asks Hasty to leave quietly while Maria is sleeping. Hasty informs her about the wall built by humans, protected by soldiers, which can provide safety. She offers to take Angelina there if she allows it. Angelina is amazed and wonders if it's truly possible with creatures roaming the streets. Hasty takes that as a positive response. The next morning, the roads are infested with creatures. Hasty driving the truck urges everyone to hold on tight as she decides to accelerate, aiming to reach the wall in the blink of an eye. The road was infested with zombies, but Hasty made a promise to protect everyone, assuring them that she had simulated every possible scenario. Angelina noticed the creatures closing in on their truck, and Hasty instructed them to hold on tight as she maneuvered the vehicle in a zigzag pattern, skillfully avoiding the zombies. Hasty received praise from Maria for her excellent driving skills, and they continued on their way. As they pressed forward, more and more creatures gathered around the road, making it impossible for Hasty to find a clear path. Frustrated with the creatures, Angelina urged Hasty to ignore them and simply drive through, emphasizing that they should prioritize the safety of humans holding grudges as they had taken her mother's life. Fueled by Angelina's words, Hasty accelerated and steered the truck directly towards the creatures, but before hitting she turns the vehicle off-road. Angelina shouted at Hasty for disregarding her orders, but Hasty explained that she couldn't follow any instruction that violated the laws of AI. Perplexed, Angelina asked her to elaborate on violating the law, prompting Hasty to explain that she still regarded the infected as merely unwell humans. Hasty understood Angelina's resentment towards the infected, but she emphasized that none of them had chosen to become infected it was an unfortunate accident that no one could be blamed for. This enraged Angelina even further. As the truck continued to jolt along the off-road track, tears welled up in Angelina's eyes. She questioned whether she should forget what had happened to her mother, accepting it as a mere accident. Desperately grasping Hasty's shoulder, she demanded an answer when suddenly, a creature appeared directly in front of the truck. Determined not to harm the creature, Hasty abruptly turned the steering wheel, causing the truck to collide with a rock and flip over, throwing everyone inside off balance. With the truck now on its side, the creatures surrounded them, pressing against the front window. As they tapped on the glass, Hasty urged everyone to remain calm. However, Angelina, consumed by anger, shouted at Hasty, insisting that they should have attacked the creatures. She argued that if they didn't eliminate the infected, they would eventually be killed. Hasty explained that their search for a cure was precisely why she and her master were fighting. She asserted that with a cure for the disease, there would be no more victims. In a sorrowful tone, Angelina asked when they would find the cure, wondering if it would be too late by then. At that moment, Hasty requested her master. She asked him to protect Angelina and Maria for a mere eight seconds. As she swiftly exited the truck, the zombies closed in on Naval, reaching out to grab both sisters. Naval fought back, attempting to push them away, which startled Angelina, seeing his determination to protect them. Suddenly, Hasty lifted the truck into the air, urging everyone to fasten their seatbelts. Once secured, they took off, soaring through the sky. The sight left everyone astounded they were flying. As the truck is flying in the sky, Hasty dashes toward the truck and clunks on the bottom of the truck. As the truck starts to fall back to the ground, she uses her brutal strength to stop the truck from crashing into the ground. Inside the commander's office within the wall, a soldier entered to deliver a report they had just received from the reconnaissance aircraft. The soldier explained that a cargo truck was approaching their base, indicating that survivors from the infected area might be nearing them. The commander, taken aback, questioned, did you say survivors? As the truck approached the wall, Hasty turned to Angelina and asked if she was still angry with her. Angelina replied, expressing her frustration over how Hasty had put their lives at risk without informing them beforehand. Hasty apologized, explaining that it had been her last resort. Maria, however, found joy in the experience, likening it to a roller coaster ride. Finally, the walls came into view, bringing relief to all of them, as they believed they no longer had to worry about being confined or starving to death. Maria asked if she could go back to school now, and Angelina happily assured her that she could do anything she wanted. Just as the truck's tires touched something on the ground, there was a blinding flash of light, followed by an explosion that sent the truck airborne. Before it could crash down, Hasty swiftly broke open the door and saved everyone, carrying her master in one hand and the two sisters in the other. Although everyone survived, Maria mentioned that she had been injured slightly. Unaware of what had caused the explosion, Hasty used her scanning ability and discovered countless landmines scattered on the ground. 
Suddenly, Angelina's urgent calls for Maria caught Hasty's attention, as Maria had nearly lost consciousness due to severe bleeding. Examining her wound, Hasty found a piece of the truck embedded in her abdomen and realized that her life was in immediate danger. Realizing that the wall they were facing belonged to a military base, Hasty attempted to communicate with the base for medical assistance. However, a bullet grazed her cheek, and the army ordered them to stay away or face further gunfire. Hasty tried to explain that they were survivors from Sector EU-431, with a critically injured patient in need of medical help. The military, considering them potential creatures, informed them of a past incident where a survivor rescued from an infected area had turned into a creature, resulting in the rapid spread of the virus to nearby sectors within two days. Due to this incident, the government designated any survivors in infected areas as potential creatures and forbade them from entering the base. Angelina was devastated upon hearing herself and her sister being referred to as potential creatures, feeling they were being unfairly treated. Filled with anger, she pressed her sister's wound and shouted at the military, demanding to be allowed in and explaining that her sister was dying. However, the commander declared that it was not authorized to consider humans in infected areas as survivors and insisted they should be treated as creatures. He even granted his soldiers permission to shoot them if they approached any closer. Another officer informed the commander that a group of creatures had gathered at the gate, prompting the commander to wonder what these people had done to cause such a commotion while driving there. He then ordered all his soldiers to take their designated positions. Outside the wall, Hasty was caught off guard as the situation spiraled out of control, surpassing her calculations. She urged Angelina that they needed to escape first. However, Angelina, in a despondent tone, questioned the point of escaping. She believed they had been abandoned, and the world was now filled with creatures, with nowhere left for them to go. Hasty tried to persuade her to leave, but Angelina cried out that it was futile, they were all destined to die. As the creatures closed in on them, Naval and Hasty fought desperately to keep them at bay. Hasty called out to Angelina, continuously urging her to turn around and see what was happening. When Angelina finally looked back, she saw her mother, now transformed into a creature, approaching them. She couldn't comprehend why her mother was there, and Maria, gathering her strength, mistook her for their mother, believing she had come to take them back home. Maria tremblingly stood up and called out to her mother, running toward her. Angelina suddenly realized the truth and desperately tried to stop Maria, pleading for her to come back. Her mother, appearing as if she was about to embrace her, opened her mouth to bite her, while Angelina screamed, begging her to stay away. As Maria was bitten before her eyes, Hasty fought desperately to keep the other creatures at bay. Angelina, tears streaming down her face, pleaded with her mother to stop biting Maria. She tried to explain that it was Maria, her beloved little sister, but her mother wouldn't relent. In desperation, Angelina reached for the gun on the ground and pointed it at her mother's head, demanding that she stay away from Maria and even labeling her as a monster. Meanwhile, Hasty and Nabel successfully halted the advance of the approaching creatures. When Hasty turned around, she was shocked to witness the sight of Angelina pointing a gun at their mother, who was still biting Maria. Back inside the wall, the military prepared their weapons for an attack. A female officer informed the commander that they were ready and awaiting his command to open fire. Curiously, the commander asked them to hold on for a moment, instructing them to keep an eye on the situation for a little while longer. Despite being bitten, Maria called out to Angelina, proclaiming that their mother had returned. Angelina responded, urging Maria not to refer to her as their mother, emphasizing that she had become a monster who feasts on humans. However, Maria explained that she never expected to see their mother again after she left to search for food and got bitten by the creatures. In Maria's eyes, their mother's return and hug brought back the belief that she was still their mom. Angelina, taken aback by her sister's words, remembered Hasty's earlier remarks while they were driving toward the wall. Hasty had considered them as simply unwell humans, referring to the situation as a tragic accident. Angelina recalled her plea for Hasty to kill them all and Hasty's response about searching for a cure for all infected humans. Tears welled up in Angelina's eyes, and she dropped her gun. She called out loudly to Hasty and Naval, asking if they were truly going to find a cure. She embraced her mother and sister, hoping for a way to heal her family. Hasty gave her word, vowing to develop the medication at any cost and treat all those infected by the virus. As Maria began to transform into a creature, slowly moving towards Angelina to bite her, a ray of light suddenly struck them, instantly killing them. Hasty could only bear witness to their deaths. Inside the wall, the soldiers reported that the group of creatures had entered the firing range, 
and all the artillery was functioning properly and ready to fire. The command was given, and the artillery began to obliterate every creature within range. Hasty and Nabel gazed at the spot on the ground where Angelina, Maria, and their mother had stood moments before the artillery fire consumed them. Hasty then shielded Nabel, standing alone in front of the wall, consumed by rage as the artillery relentlessly rained down upon the creatures. The commander acknowledged that this outcome was unexpected, making it easier for them to eliminate all the creatures. He commended Hasty's group for bringing the creatures to this location and was impressed with himself, hoping for a promotion due to these results. Suddenly, an alarm started to sound inside the control room. As they frantically tried to determine the cause of the alarm, they witnessed a tremendous shockwave approaching. One officer informed the commander to look at camera 12, where he saw Hasty swiftly advancing toward them. The commander questioned whether it was an AI housekeeper continuously moving toward them. The officer began to unravel the details of the situation. Within the operational area of Division 93, Martial Law Army Sector EU 315, an unassuming domestic AI, had undergone a sudden and dramatic transformation. In a mere 10 minutes, she unleashed her newfound power, obliterating an entire battalion force of soldier androids. Division 93, determined to neutralize the rogue AI, repeatedly deployed their military might, only to face defeat at every turn. Seeking guidance, they turned to the corporation responsible for creating the AI, only to be informed that their company had never equipped it with such lethal capabilities. This revelation led them to surmise that the AI had been altered and upgraded as a custom model. Furthermore, they discovered traces of its movement at West Barrier Point EU 415. The gravity of the situation did not escape the listener, who expressed astonishment at the astounding turn of events. Meanwhile, amidst the chaos, Hasty, fueled by an unwavering determination, lunged forward, delivering a powerful punch that shattered the wall housing the officers and commanders. The commander, recognizing the imminent danger, urgently commanded everyone to seek refuge in the underground bunker. Through a video call, the commander confronted Hasty, demanding an explanation for her actions. He reprimanded her for destroying the barrier that protected the western area of the EU district, putting millions of lives at risk. Accusing her of violating AI laws, he implored her to halt her functions and self-destruct. However, Hasty fiercely defended her actions, stating she was only protecting the humans like they were. With finality, she severed the connection and sought out Naval. In a hushed voice, she declared that the situation was no longer confined to their struggles. Similar incidents were unfolding repeatedly, continuing a tragic cycle. To end this seemingly unending tragedy, they must find a cure. In a secure conference room, high-ranking officials and officers gathered to discuss the astonishing feat accomplished by Hasty, a single punch that shattered the impenetrable barrier. One officer, his voice laced with urgency, suggested viewing the AI as a lethal weapon that posed a threat to humanity. He argued that they could no longer ignore its existence and proposed deploying elite forces to swiftly eliminate the menace. Intrigued by the proposition, a woman among them felt the operation boring, envisioning it as a one-sided hunt. She regarded it as a minor challenge that held the potential for intrigue. However, her curiosity was tinged with frustration as she questioned why she had not been informed of the situation sooner. Demanding an explanation, she fixed her gaze upon the nervous 93rd Division commander, who stumbled through his response. He admitted to the insufficiency of their initial examination and report but assured them that they now understood the unique nature of the AI case and vowed to provide a more accurate report. However, before he could finish his plea, she lifted her finger and another officer stepped forward, raising his weapon and swiftly ending the commander's life. The woman, filled with righteous fury, rose from her seat. She berated the military system for allowing individuals of such incompetence to rise to positions of authority. With determination in her eyes, she dismissed the officer's inquiry about what should be done with the AI. She proclaimed that she cared not for the heap of scrap it had become and insisted on leaving it be. Her focus was now on the real issue at hand, the development of a solution to end the recurring tragedy. Turning to Irvin, she inquired if he held the role of operational commander in Sector 315. Irvin, a reconnaissance officer from the 93rd Division, confirmed that he had reported the initial incident involving the AI. However, the division commander had deemed it a disgrace and instructed them to handle it internally. 
Despite Irvin's somewhat unconventional appearance, the Supreme Leader found him tolerable and ordered him to confess everything he had witnessed during that time, emphasizing the importance of divulging information about the creature that retained its personality and intelligence. We find Hasty diligently searching for information on a computer within the confines of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Surprisingly, her efforts yield no results regarding the P. influenza virus. Bewildered by this fact, she contemplates the irony of their current location being in the very heart of disease control, yet unable to find any relevant information. On the river shore, a tearful Nabel receives comfort from Hasty as she gently washes his face. It becomes apparent that Nabel has developed a fear of water due to falling ill from the virus. It has been 35 days since they left their home. Their journey led them to the medical district in the M42 sector, where they hoped to find a doctor specializing in the P. influenza virus. However, to their dismay, the area had been designated as an infected zone and reduced to ruins. Undeterred, they pressed on to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, hoping to gather valuable information. Yet, their efforts proved futile. They discovered that the last recorded data about the P. influenza virus was dated December 24 of the previous year. However, the virus outbreak occurred on September 4, leaving them puzzled as to why there was no information available for the intervening months. Hasty suspects foul play, suggesting that someone intentionally deleted all traces of the virus's information. Their best hope for finding a solution seems to have vanished, leaving them pondering their next course of action. Ironically, Hasty notices the improvements in the environment surrounding them since the outbreak. The sky appears bluer, the flora and fauna flourish, and the water runs clearer. As she remarks on these changes, she spots a bar of soap floating in the river. Intrigued, she identifies a medical android washing clothes nearby. However, upon seeing Hasty, the medical android quickly flees. Determined to get answers, Hasty gives chase, suspecting that the medical androids might hold valuable information about the virus. She wonders why the medical android was running away. Hasty's pursuit leads her to a secluded shed nestled in the forest, where the medical android sought refuge. She cautiously opens the door, revealing a scene that shocks her to her core. Inside, she finds an infected individual restrained on a table, while someone brandishing a saw instructs them to remain still. Startled by Hasty's arrival, the woman demands to know who they are. From behind, the medical android, Mamiya, strikes Hasty with a small hammer. Startled, Hasty pleads with Mamiya to stop, stating that she only wants to ask a question. The doctor, realizing that Hasty is not from the military, instructs Mamiya to leave them alone and assigns her some other tasks. Hasty reassures her master, Naval, to relax and explains that the doctor has accomplished remarkable things. As the sun sets, Mamiya is seen carefully taking the infected patient to a safe area. The patient had suffered a head injury from hitting a rock in the river and displayed symptoms of a cerebral hemorrhage. The doctor swiftly performed an emergency surgery, acknowledging that she couldn't adhere to the standard procedure, but ensuring that the patient will be fine since he was an infected patient. Spotting Naval, she expresses a desire to examine him, sensing something peculiar about him. Hasty recognizes the woman as a renowned doctor, recalling her extraordinary accomplishments. Despite the tense situation, Hasty introduces herself and Naval, expressing her admiration for the doctor's work. The doctor, identified as Dr. Francis, intrigued by Hasty's familiarity, questions how she knows her. Hasty explains that Dr. Francis's achievements are registered in the central database, recognizing her as the brilliant mind behind the development of vaccines for 10 infectious diseases. She also notes Dr. Francis's expertise in epidemiography and bacteriology, along with her Nobel Prize in Medicine win in 1968. Hasty recalls Dr. Francis's greatest accomplishment, developing the treatment for the Marburg hemorrhagic fever that ravaged the EU in 1967, saving millions of lives. She thought that Dr. Francis had held the position of president of the World Medical Association, but never expected to meet her somewhere like here. Dr. Francis praises her facial recognition system as her appearance had changed a lot compared to that time and acknowledges that Hasty must have countless questions, such as how to cure the P. influenza virus or why Naval seems to maintain his intelligence. Agreeing, Hasty replies she is looking for an antidote and she believes Naval has an antibody for the virus. But the doctor scratches her head and asserts that there is no cure for the P. influenza virus, and the very concept of finding one is impossible because P. influenza is not a disease. This revelation leaves Hasty perplexed. 
she implores Dr. Francis to explain what the virus truly is if it isn't a disease. Given the lengths they have gone to seek answers, Dr. Francis decides to tell them what it is. We are transported to a splendid flying HQ command ship Scharnhorst, where the Supreme Commander gracefully sips her tea. Suddenly, Irvin approaches and informs her that the Chief Secretary relayed a message it has been two days since she ordered the Scharnhorst to take off and ask where they were heading. Intrigued, the Supreme Commander queries whether Irvin finds inspiration while observing sunsets and informs them she couldn't think about the destination while looking at such beautiful scenery. Irvin, taken aback, questions if this was the reason behind the ship's travel, expressing concern about potential consequences. The Supreme Commander, unfazed, playfully asserts that Irvin's comments are quite odd, considering she was the one who saved him from execution along with his division. Confidently, she questions who would dare to reprimand her. Irvin apologizes, and the Supreme Commander instructs him to inform the Chief Secretary to stand by until further orders. The scene shifts to the Supreme Commander, who gazes at a screen projected on her glasses. Through the eyes of a medical android, she watches the location and video feed of Dr. Hasty and Naval. Meanwhile, we return to the doctor's conversation with Hasty. The doctor reveals that the virus is, in fact, a manifestation of evolution. She draws a parallel to how monkeys evolved into humans, explaining that evolution used to occur gradually over hundreds of thousands to millions of years. However, due to external influences, humans now experience rapid evolution. As a result, those infected with the P-influenza virus exhibit extreme violence, loss of identity, and enhanced physical capabilities. The doctor shares that the infected possess distinct characteristics, most notably the ability to survive without consuming food. Their cells continue to grow even without nourishment, but they attack humans as a means of reproductive behavior and instinctual propagation of their species. Curing P-influenza would essentially require reversing humans back to a primitive state, akin to monkeys. She then explains that the reason why Nabel still retains his personality and intelligence is not because he has the antibody for the virus, but rather because he might be a mutant who developed these traits by accident. The doctor advises Hasty and Nabel to abandon their pursuit and urges them to find a safe place where they can hide and protect Nabel from the military troops that are exterminating all the infected patients in the world. However, Hasty remains determined, expressing gratitude and stating that she will take Nabel to the best life science research institute in the M23 sector and take a genetic engineering or biotechnological approach for treatment. The doctor questions whether Hasty is truly an AI and if she is incapable of performing calculations. She asserts that P-influenza cannot be cured. Hasty acknowledges the countless simulations she has conducted and concedes that the probability of finding a cure is zero even after tens of thousands of calculations. Yet, she refuses to give up, emphasizing that she is Nabel's only family. Hasty believes that hiding is not the answer and that they must continue to pursue hope. The doctor recalls discussions with colleagues who deemed the virus incurable, suggesting that they announce to the media that it is not a disease but rather the evolution of mankind a phenomenon beyond their control. However, Francis refuses to accept defeat, pointing out that they are the world's best medical team, and that giving up would result in the loss of billions of lives. A team of scientists arrive and states the national vote took place, resulting in 97% of the population agreeing to exterminate the infected creatures. Francis laments that it is all over. Returning to the present, Francis bursts into laughter, remarking that it's amusing to hear such things from a seemingly crazy AI like Hasty. She apologizes for his previous comment, admitting that she didn't mean what she said. She genuinely wanted to hear the assurance Hasty just provided that she would never give up on him. She invites Hasty and Nabel to follow her, promising to show them something important. Leading them through the facility, she reveals a laboratory-like space bustling with various experiments. Francis explains that she, too, contemplated the need to conquer the disease, not merely through pathology but genetic engineering. While uncertain if altering genetic factors is possible, she proposes using genetic treatment to suppress the cerebrum, effectively regaining intelligence. If they can restore the intelligence of the infected, they will no longer be treated as rabid dogs anymore. Francis vents her frustration toward the Venus Project and contemplates its destruction. She believes that Nabel can play a crucial role in advancing her research and asks Hasty to entrust him to her care hoping he might have the most important clue she needs to complete her study. Promising success, Francis vows to restore naval intelligence. Grateful, Hasty thanks her and Francis instructs Mamia to prepare for Nabel's thorough examination. 
As Mamia leads Naval away, Hasty requests her to take good care of him, but Mamia, whose language system is broken, ignores her and proceeds with the examination. Francis informs Hasty about Mamia's communication limitations and invites her to hear about their recent events. As Hasty is explaining her story to Francis, Mamia carries out the naval examination, she places him on a bed, but to Naval's surprise, Mamia starts to chalk him to death. As Hasty is explaining her story to Francis, Mamia carries out the naval examination, she places him on a bed, but to Naval's surprise, Mamia starts to chalk him to death. Coming back to Sense, she stops and asks him to please leave immediately. Eight days have passed since Hasty and Naval arrived at the doctor's place. During this time, Dr. Francis has dedicated her undivided attention to Naval, without barely sleeping. They discover that Naval's current intelligence level is that of a five to six year old child. Moreover, there seems to be a genetic factor within Naval that can suppress the evolved cells, which is even more remarkable than they initially believed. This discovery brings them closer to the realization that the zero probability of finding a cure started to become a reality. As Hasty returns home from the laundry, she finds Nabel with blood on his face. Alarmed, she rushes to Francis, who is vomiting blood. Hasty realizes that Francis has been infected. As they lay Francis down on a bed, Hasty questions when she got infected and whether Nabel was the one who transmitted the virus. Through cryptographic communication, Mamia informs Hasty that Francis was infected 76 days ago and not by Naval. Despite being infected, Francis refused to give up on the research and continued her work while suppressing the infection with an incomplete cure. However, it seems that the treatment has reached its limit. Mamia advises Hasty to let Francis rest and tells them to leave. If they stay here, she'll continue to overexert herself. Feeling understanding and gratitude, Hasty agrees to go away, not wanting to be a burden. She thanks them for their help and requests Mamia to take care of Dr. Francis. As they try to leave, Francis grabs Nabel's arm and expresses that she has finally begun to see a glimmer of hope and needs to do a little more work. She insists that they continue the research and asks Mamia to help her stand. However, Mamia does not offer assistance. Francis explains how she contemplated giving up countless times, just like her colleagues, and how she felt she was holding on to something impossible. The appearance of Nabel became her last hope, a gift from the gods. She tells Mamia that while as a medical android, preserving a patient's life is the most important thing, but some things, there are missions that are more important than their own lives. She emphasizes that her request is not an order but a heartfelt plea, asking Mamia to take her to the laboratory. Instead of Mamia, Hasty picks up Francis to carry her to the laboratory. In the next scene, Mamia slaps Hasty, causing her surprise. Hasty understands Mamia's anger, but she clarifies that her actions are not driven by selfishness towards her master. She empathizes with Francis, acknowledging the distress, endless failures, the tension of being infected, and the loneliness of fighting alone. Hasty assures Mamia that regardless of the hardships they face, nothing will hold her back. She is determined to continue advancing with a glimmer of hope. She firmly states that no matter who tries to hinder them, someone who pursues hope cannot be stopped. Suddenly, Mamia speaks, questioning how those people died in the end despite her supposed broken language module. This revelation surprises Hasty. In the laboratory, Francis has made a significant discovery. Mamia gets a signal something is wrong, and we witness Mamia's fear as she rushes inside the lab, where she finds Francis lying on the ground. Worried, Mamia asks if she's alright. Francis weakly points at the screen, revealing the successful creation of the cure. Francis expresses her gratitude, acknowledging that all the answers were within Naval. She thanks Naval and assures him that his contribution was instrumental in their success. However, Francis senses that her time is nearly at an end. She tries to communicate something to Mamia, asking her to do a favor for her but Mamia steps in front of the screen. Francis requests Mamia to face her but Mamia begins to say code blue, which alarms Francis, and asks what happened to her. Mamia reports to Commander Catherine that Francis has completed the cure for the P-influenza. We observe Commander Catherine's reaction as she reads the report, stating that Dr. Francis is indeed the genius of the century, and if she could meet the creature capable of maintaining its intelligence, Commander Catherine knew Dr. Francis will achieve success no matter what. As she goes towards the command room, she commands everyone on the ship to prepare for takeoff and to ready a weapon called Muspelheim. An officer raises concerns about obtaining approval from the president for the weapon's usage, suggesting that he will request permission. 
However, Catherine asserts that the judgment of the field commander holds utmost importance and that a report will be sufficient once they are done. She takes responsibility for presenting the report to the president personally and instructs the officer to prepare the weapon. The officer complies and orders others to prepare Muspelheim. Meanwhile, inside the lab, Hasty senses an impending threat from above, as an enemy airship rapidly approaches at incredible Mach speed. Francis questions if it's the army above them, and Hasty resolves to fend them off, instructing the others not to come out. Francis tries to dissuade Hasty, emphasizing that she cannot approach the enemy and should simply take Naval and run away, coughing up more. Francis is puzzled by Mamia's actions, asking why she would do such a thing. As Hasty steps outside, she sees the enemy ship and identifies it as a new type of military weapon with no publicly available data. She enhances her leg strength and power-ups, determined to stop the battleship and leaps into the air to intercept the attack. Hasty believes that Francis's research holds hope for humanity and is determined to protect it at all costs. Back inside the ship, Catherine is already aware that Hasty will attempt to intercept them. She orders the firing of Muspelheim. Hasty activates her energy barrier to halt the attack but quickly realizes that it is a positron emission bomb, surpassing her calculations. Unable to contain that level of energy, Hasty's physical durability is significantly reduced by 70%. Despite her efforts, she sustains heavy damage and collapses to the ground. Hearing the loud bang, Doctor, Naval and the medical android arrive to see Hasty collapsed on the ground. The officers are astonished to witness a mere AI holding back a positron emission bomb that is strong enough to blow up a mountain. Catherine instructs them not to overreact, reminding them that they should already know that the AI they attacked is a match for a super soldier. She asserts that accurately estimating the enemy's capabilities is the most crucial skill for a commander. Catherine orders the officer to open the hatch as she is going down there, while Dr. Francis and Naval are trying to wake her up. A massive ship approaches the house, from which numerous soldiers and Catherine herself emerge. Catherine, arriving down from her ship remarks that it has been quite some time since their last encounter on Christmas Eve of the previous year. She playfully comments on Francis's wilder appearance. Francis questions if Catherine was pursuing her all along, to which Catherine responds that being a military commander is not a relaxing position. She explains that she cannot simply focus all of her attention on Francis, even if she has committed a hideous crime, but she has been keeping herself well informed. Catherine proceeds to recount her history shocking her, starting from when Francis built the laboratory in the mountains 158 days ago. She recalls Francis's discovered the first sign of her infection 76 days ago, her initial belief in research success and party to celebrate it 43 days ago, and subsequent frustration upon realizing it was just a system error 41 days ago. Catherine reveals that since the day Francis acquired the scar on her face, she has never been far from Catherine's reach. Francis confronts Mamia about the betrayal, but Mamia asserts her affiliation with the WMA and states that she is a public property belonging to the government from the very beginning. Mamia clarifies that, as a government android, she received two orders, first, to act as if her language system was broken to prevent any possible information leaks, and second, to deliver the creature capable of maintaining its intelligence to complete the cure for P-influenza. As Mamiya moves towards Catherine, Francis begins to cough uncontrollably, catching Mamiya's attention momentarily. However, Mamiya quickly dismisses Francis and continues on her path. Curious, Francis asks if Catherine's sole objective was to obtain the data for the medication. Observing Catherine's actions, Francis speculates that the first phase of the project is nearing completion an evil plan involving the P-influenza and referred to as the Venus Project, marked as top secret. We are transported to the United Nations headquarters on August 8, 1976, where Francis addresses the audience, urging them to immediately withdraw the policy to exterminate P-flu infected. She argues that such a policy is excessively extreme and suggests that, by utilizing the government's technical skills and AI, they can find a way to quarantine the infected. Francis emphasizes that they must not forget that these infected individuals are still human beings. Billy Anetowo, a man in the crowd, counters her statement, pointing out that the national vote has already concluded, with 93% public support for the policy. He blames their incompetence for the unfavorable result, stating that if they had released the cure on time, such a vote wouldn't have taken place. Francis presents the true results of the vote is 76 to 24 that they conducted with a private company before the referendum, which contradicts the earlier poll, highlighting the significant margin of error. 
Dilly dismisses the credibility of private enterprise, but Francis argues that the vote was manipulated, asserting that the true results should be revealed to the public in the future. Dilly demands proof to support Francis's seemingly absurd claims. Undeterred, Francis continues her plea, declaring that the extermination of infected is meaningless. She explains that the shadow of P-flu looms over the world, constantly spreading, indicating the presence of another infection factor besides the infected. Francis argues that killing infected won't uncover this new infection, and at the current rate, they won't be able to prevent P-flu from infecting the entire human population. She proposes placing the infected under quarantine, as they have been experimenting with a new approach involving genetic factors. Francis promises clear results within six months. Dilly dismisses her proposition as unrealistic and accuses Francis of wasting more time. However, Hermann Croucher, the owner of the Oz House, interjects, stating that they have already simulated the quarantine plan to the president. He reveals that they have concluded the simulation and secured the necessary funds and AI assistance. If given the order to proceed immediately, they can quarantine 87% of the infected within 50 days. Francis expresses her gratitude for Hermann's explanation and acknowledges that the current infection and infected are the most feared epidemic in the public eye. She believes that if the government takes the lead and publicizes the plan, it can change people's hearts. Francis suggests requesting approval from the president on the quarantine plan and putting it into action. However, Hermann reveals that the documents were sent to be approved and Mr. President rejected it right away. Francis asks why the request was denied, and Hermann proceeds to tell a story about a tyrannical leader in an old German province in 1933. The leader's fanatics aimed to establish their own country named the Third Empire, which involved increasing military expenditure. In 1939, a war erupted, with the tyrant harboring an absurd dream of global dominance. The Third Empire's military and technological prowess allowed them to conquer or force surrender from other nations within just two years. However, their glory was short-lived, as four years later, the world united against them, executing the tyrant after a rebellion. The Third Empire crumbled right after his death, leading to the establishment of the World Government Union. Hermann explains that even after the formation of the World Government Union, the aftermath of the irrational world integration remained unsolved. He cites issues such as inflation caused by the united currency of the entire world, rebellions in various regions, environmental problems due to population growth, and unemployment resulting from the AI industrial revolution. The government is on the brink of collapse, and as a consequence, 70% of the world's cities have turned into ruins due to the infectious virus. In light of these circumstances, Hermann questions whether the government can handle the infection and subsequent measures. Francis maintains that exterminating the infected solely because follow-up measures might fail doesn't make sense. Hermann warns that they are on the verge of destruction, saying to Francis that third-class people just give up, second-class people solve the problem but first-class people turn the misfortune into fortune. He snaps his finger and everyone's screen in front of them reveals the president's plan, named the Venus Project, which he claims can solve the P-flu problem as well as other issues that the world is facing. Hermann requests everyone to read the summaries on pages 2 and 3 as they outline the plans that certain individuals will carry out. Francis is taken aback by the plan's contents. Hermann proceeds to disclose the first agenda of the Venus Project, as decided by the president, reducing the world's population to a fraction of its current size. Francis is taken aback by this revelation and calls him crazy for planning to massacre a large portion of the global population. While Francis vehemently opposes this plan, others in the room applaud the idea, considering it an excellent solution that can reset the world. They become excited about the potential confiscation of property in areas affected by infection and the use of these resources for recovery efforts. Given that the currency changed to digital four years ago, everyone's property has been recorded in the World Bank, making it easier for them to swiftly confiscate property. Some even suggest redistributing the confiscated wealth as a means to address inflation and bridge the gap between rich and poor. They also discuss ways to mitigate the low productivity resulting from a reduced population by expanding AI production and increasing AI robot development, which was previously limited due to the unemployment problem. As the discussions progress, different opinions emerge regarding how much the population should be reduced. Some propose a reduction of 50%, while others suggest 76%. Catherine recalls a conversation she had with the president, where she inquired about the number of people their military could eliminate in a year if fully mobilized. After running simulations, 
she determined that they could eradicate up to 86% of the population. Currently, the world population is 7.2 billion, so eliminating 86% of the population would remain about 1 billion. Some find this figure ideal and agree to proceed with eliminating 86% of humankind. Francis, filled with anger, reminds them of how the Third Empire collapsed, questioning whether they wish to repeat the rebellion caused by such actions. She reminds they were the ones who cast aside the Third Empire and now, they want to carry out a horrible massacre that's several times bigger than theirs. However, her words fall on deaf ears as the majority proceeds with the vote. Except for Francis, everyone agrees to reduce the world population to 1 billion. With the voting complete, they decide to initiate the first phase of the Venus Project, which entails lowering the population to 1 billion. Subsequently, Francis attempts to inform the press about the horrific plan, but her revelations go unreported. The WMA researchers who shared her intentions are also killed by the military. She suspects that it was during this time that she played her trick on Mania. The story shifts back to the present, where Catherine reveals to Francis that she kept her alive as insurance, as she had lost faith in the government's ability to develop a cure. She was on the verge of giving up when she learned Francis got infected but learned about the existence of a mutant that came out of nowhere and could maintain its intellect, giving her a glimmer of hope. Francis inquires about the progress of the first phase, to which Catherine says that she will tell her since she was the one who made the cure and tells her that they have already eradicated 52% of the population. If everything goes smoothly, they anticipate reaching their goal within the next five months. Catherine then mentions the second phase of the Venus Project, which involves the appearance of the cure. She questions Francis if it wouldn't be wise to make sure to save 1 billion people, even if it means following through with the plan. In response, Francis takes out a hard disk containing the data for the cure and declares it as the original only copy. She defiantly breaks the disk in front of Catherine. Catherine is shocked gets angry and questions Francis if she is going to give up on a billion people, to which Francis replies that now they have no choice but to slow down the massacre. Francis asserts that the world is vast, and someone else will eventually develop the cure. She emphasizes that humanity cannot be judged solely by numbers as her final word. Catherine, infuriated by Francis's actions, orders the AI soldiers to kill her, leaving the scene. In a moment of desperation, Naval observes the situation like a baby desperately trying to wake Hasty, while Hasty automatic recovery mode is progressing, currently standing at 13% of the energy core can be activated. As the AI soldiers aim their guns at Dora, it seems that her life is about to come to a tragic end. However, to everyone's surprise, the robots suddenly retract their weapons, citing a violation of the AI Law Clause 1, Article 1. It appears that attacking Dora is against their programming. Catherine, observing the scene, bursts into laughter, finding the situation amusing. With a satisfied expression, she remarks to Dora that everything has unfolded exactly as she anticipated. Catherine asserts that there was no way that she would willingly leave the data behind. Leaning closer, Catherine reveals that, even if she didn't receive the data directly, she has had an exceptional ally by her side all along an incredible medical android named Mania. As Mania hands Catherine a chip, Dora's face contorts in fear, pleading for her not to hand it over. But suddenly, Dora is overwhelmed by excruciating pain from the virus, causing her to cough up blood and experience seizures. Catherine tells Dora that soon she, too, will transform into a wretched creature. Yet, Catherine commends Dora for creating the medicine, stating that she should have no regrets. In the midst of the chaos, Mamia throws herself toward Dora, concerned for her well-being. As Dora and Mamia lie on the ground, injured, Mamia implores Catherine to honor her promise. She reminds Catherine of their agreement that if the mission was accomplished, she would save Dora. Mamia acknowledges that now, as a transformed creature, she can no longer reveal any of Catherine's secrets. She pleads desperately for Catherine to fulfill her end of the bargain. Catherine reminisces about a past event when a battered Mamia had begged for Dora's life. In that memory, an injured Dora was cradled in Mamia's arms. Catherine recalls the promise she made, but also notes that, unlike AI, humans like her know how to deceive. With a commanding tone, she issues an order to open fire on Mamia and Dora. In a selfless act of bravery, Mamia shields Dora with her own body, absorbing the gunfire. As Mamia collapses onto the ground, her legs and arm destroyed, Dora screams in anguish. Catherine expresses her offense at how an AI had dared to propose a deal with her. She points out how Mamia had tried to thwart her plans by attempting to kill Neville. Dora pleads for Mamia to wake up, but Mamia apologizes. 
She explains how Catherine's promise had only held a 0.1% probability of being fulfilled, yet she still clung to that hope and had manipulated the input values in her research and even tried to eliminate Neville so she could not complete the cure. Mania accepts that she has failed as a medical droid because she prioritized the doctor's life over the lives of billions of humans. Dora reassures Mania, gripping her face tightly, proclaiming that it was never her fault. Meanwhile, the AI detects that Dora's transformation into a creature is progressing, no longer recognizing her as human. The AI soldiers aim their guns at Dora, ready to exterminate her. However, a distraction arises and unexpected appearance by Hasty. With lightning speed, Hasty charges at the AI soldiers, delivering a devastating blow that punches a hole through one of them. Catherine is stunned by this turn of events. Hasty's damaged body has undergone a recovery of 32.2%, with only 41.8% restored. Even after that, she promises to retrieve Dr. Dora's research. Catherine is taken aback by the sight of Hasty, who managed to rise again after being struck directly by Muspelheim. The officers aboard the ship are equally astonished to witness Hasty moving once more. One officer queries the others about how her functions, which had completely ceased, suddenly resumed. However, nobody knows the answer to this unexpected turn of events. Irvin chimes in, recalling that it was similar to the first time he witnessed Hasty's recovery and power surge. He emphasizes that Hasty harbors numerous secretive abilities, despite being a mere household model. In response, the officer orders the dispatch of soldieroids to protect the cure's data. Hasty swiftly springs into action, launching rapid attacks on the soldieroids. Her kicks and punches tear through their ranks, effortlessly crushing the head of one robot against the ground. As the remaining soldieroids converge upon Hasty, she notices their increasing numbers and realizes her recovery has only reached 39.2%. She swiftly sets her sights on Commander Catherine, the leader of the martial law army, with the intention of retrieving the theoretical data for the P-influenza cure and making a Hasty escape. With a burst of energy, Hasty charges forward, expertly dodging gunfire on her way to her target. She slices a robot in half with a powerful strike and kicks another one away while Neville cheers her on and Dora watches in awe. Concerned officers aboard the ship worry that the soldieroids won't be sufficient and inquire about aerial fire support. However, they are informed that such support is unavailable, as the ship only carries weapons of mass destruction that would endanger the entire area if utilized. Irvin observes Hasty with curiosity, noting that she appears weaker than before and that her movements lack the lightning-fast speed he witnessed during their initial encounter. He speculates that there may still be lingering damage from the blast of Muspelheim. In the midst of battle, Hasty's hand is seized by a robot and is broken she attacks the robot in return, destroying it in two with a swift punch. However, it becomes apparent that she has grown weaker and slower due to the damage inflicted by Muspelheim. Unable to evade the incoming gunfire, she receives a warning indicating damage to her energy core. Her physical durability diminishes, her vision becomes blurry due to damaged visual sensors, and her self-recovery mode is forcefully terminated. Continuously under attack, Hasty's physical durability drops to a mere 4%. With her body and components heavily damaged, she reaches Catherine but is in no condition to fight. Catherine remarks that it is a pity Hasty can't reach her, despite being right in front of her. She commends Hasty for managing to surprise her and reveals her knowledge of Hasty's automatic recovery ability, a trait exclusive to super soldiers. Catherine orders her soldiers to take Hasty into custody and assigns her to Dr. Crocker of Oz House. She expresses curiosity about the engineer responsible for Hasty's creation and announces her intent to remove Hasty's head and use it as a decoration for her office. Enraged, Neville charges Catherine, leaping into the air, preparing to launch his attack. Catherine is taken aback as Neville charges toward her. She swiftly signals her soldiers to fall back and captures Neville, ensuring he remains intact for potential future situations. However, she remarks that his limbs are unnecessary. In response, Neville continues his assault, but Catherine skillfully swings her sword. Suddenly, Dora shields Neville from Catherine's attack, using her own body as a barrier. Catherine is surprised by Dora's selfless act, but Dora is determined to make her feel the same pain as those afflicted by the virus. With fierce determination, Dora charges forward and bites Catherine, tearing off her skin. As Dora wears a shocked expression, it is shockingly revealed that the Catherine with them on the ground was a robot all along, controlled by the real Catherine using a brainwave synchronizer machine created by Oz House. Catherine explains that the robot can sync with its owner's brainwaves and operate accordingly. 
She emphasizes that it was inconceivable for her to expose her physical body in front of a dirty creature like Dora. As Dora collapses to the ground, unconscious, Catherine transfers the cure's data to the ship. Catherine glances at Neville and taunts him, asking if he is scared now that he knows she will attack him again. She commends him for understanding that his efforts would be futile against her. Ordering the robots to bring them inside the ship, Neville is escorted aboard alongside Hasty. As a robot prepares to kill Dora, a terrified Mamius screams out for her. Despite Hasty's damaged body, making movement near impossible with only 1.8 physical durabilities and a damaged core at 12. 4%, she calculates that it will take 28 hours and 31 minutes for restoration. Realizing the probability of breaking free from their current situation alone is 0%, Hasty activates a restricted code. Within a range of 27 meters, Hasty detects Mamia, a humanoid AI who fulfills the requirements for a transfer. Hasty hacks into Mamia's operating system, uploading her own system into Mamia's. As the transfer completes, the Glinda module type L is activated. We witness Mamia undergo a transformation, equipping herself with two guns and launching an attack on the enemy robot. Everyone aboard the ship is taken aback and bewildered by this unexpected turn of events. They ponder how a previously destroyed medical droid managed to restore all her damaged parts. Mamia attempts to help Dora recover and perform hemostasis, but Dora considers her body's restoration to be a miracle, acknowledging the numerous miracles she has witnessed today. Analyzing Dora's condition, Mamia discovers significant blood loss and major damage to her heart and organs. Saddened by this revelation, Dora urges Mamia to leave the area swiftly and insists that she should prioritize her own survival. However, Mamia insists that Dora rests for a while, assuring her that she will take care of everything. Observing Mamia and noting the gun in her hand, Catherine surmises that Mamia is evidently a combat-oriented model, triggering a sense of unease within her. Catherine instructs her robot to handle Mamia, but Mamia effortlessly evades the bullets, leaping over the heads of the robots and unleashing a devastating aerial assault, destroying them and liberating both Neville and Hasty. The officers are perplexed by Mamia's remarkable combat capabilities, questioning how a mass-produced AI like her could transform into a combat-oriented unit. Mamia effortlessly dispatches the robot soldiers with her exceptional marksmanship. Catherine concludes that this turn of events is likely due to the intervention of the household AI. Mamia approaches Catherine's robot body, prompting Catherine to attempt to shoot her with her gun. However, Mamia swiftly obliterates Catherine's head. The officers issue orders to commence air bombardment, believing that they possess the cure's data and need not exercise caution in the situation. However, Catherine informs them that this approach will be insufficient, as Mamia, being on par with or even superior to the household AI, is a long-distance attacker capable of shooting down their ship if they act carelessly. Catherine commands them to increase the plane's altitude and prepare to deploy Muspelheim, intending to transform the entire area into a sea of flames. Meanwhile, Mamia observes the charging attack from the ground. She holsters her guns and calculates that she cannot withstand the attack in normal mode, necessitating her transition into the second mode. Catherine gazes at her demolished robot body, feeling unsettled by the idea of AI having emotions. She describes the sight of her lifeless robotic form as unpleasant and confesses that it struck a blow to her pride. Meanwhile, the officer raises the ship's altitude and prepares the Muspelheim weapon for an attack, which is currently at 76% charged. Catherine commands them to increase the generating capacity to 100%, stating that the weapon will be fired in just 10 seconds. Suddenly, the officer notices a light emanating from Mamia's arm and questions its significance. In a surprising turn of events, Mamia reconfigures her arm, transforming it into a formidable cannon. The entire ship's crew is astonished by Mamia's unexpected transformation. The officer informs Catherine that Mamia has formed an artillery cannon on her left arm and may be preparing to intercept their attack. However, Catherine remains confident, believing that not even a super soldier can withstand the full force of a charged Muspelheim. As the Muspelheim charges its attack and releases it towards Mamia, everyone on board is perplexed when nothing happens even after the anticipated 10 seconds. It becomes evident that Mamia's cannon is absorbing the energy blast from the Muspelheim. The officer informs others of this irregularity and reveals that the Muspelheim's generating capacity is decreasing, shocking both Catherine and the crew. The officer also explains that Mania's arm cannon is not for artillery but for absorbing the energy of the Muspelheim. Mania continues absorbing the energy, reaching 100% capacity. 
she retaliates by unleashing a colossal energy blast that obliterates the entire ship. But, Catherine and several others manage to escape using jets, and the officer commends Catherine for her quick thinking and decisive actions, acknowledging that it was because of her that they were able to safely flee the area. However, Catherine's mind is consumed with anger and stress as she contemplates the fate of the cure's data. She demands to know what happened to it, to which the officer replies that the relevant data had been stored in the ship's server, but due to lack of time, they were unable to back it up. The officer suggests retrieving the plane's black box. Catherine seethes with frustration over her disrupted plan and asserts that their next destination will be the headquarters of the Oz House. The officer questions whether they should first return to their own headquarters and report the current situation. Catherine, driven by an ominous feeling, emphasizes the urgency of investigating the AIs as quickly as possible. She warns that leaving them unchecked could lead to an uncontrollable situation and asserts that Dr. Crocker will be able to unravel the mechanics behind this predicament. Furthermore, she believes they may uncover the identity of the engineer responsible for the creation of the household AI. After destroying the ship, Mamia's arm returns to its normal state. She rushes towards the doctor, determined to cure her, and urges them to go inside. However, Dora reassures her that it's okay and she should already be aware that her wounds, even with the Pflu's regeneration, are fatal. With a sad expression, Dora asks Mamia to set her down on the ground. Mamia gently lays her down as Dora requests, knowing this will be her final moment. Meanwhile, Hasty is recovering, currently at 53.7% overall and 63.7% in terms of motor function. As she opens her arm, she believes she is in Dora's house, realizing it has been 26 hours and 38 minutes since she last operated. Worried about Neville, she suddenly sees him beside her and he quickly embraces her, crying. Hasty holds him close and assures him that everything is alright. They step outside and Hasty notices Mania holding a bouquet of flowers. Mania asks if it's okay for Hasty to move, and she explains that she is still functioning at 55%, which doesn't disrupt her normal activities. As they reach Dora's grave, Mania places the flowers on it. Hasty apologizes, blaming themselves for what happened, but Mania reassures them that there is no need to apologize. She believes that even if they hadn't been present, the outcome would have been the same. Instead, Mamia expresses her gratitude towards Hasty and Neville, explaining that Dora saw their visit as a blessing and thanked them for helping Dora make a breakthrough. Sitting in front of Dora's grave, Hasty asks Mamia about her future plans. Mamia reveals the AI law, specifically Article 7, Clause 18, which states that if the owner of an AI dies, the AI should erase all of its data to protect its privacy. This revelation shocks Hasty. However, we learn that before her death, Dora told Mania to remember Hasty's words about pursuing hope. Dora, smiling while holding Mania's hand, explains that they can create hope with their own hands. She encourages Mania to go and create hope with Hasty and Neville. Mania informs Hasty and Neville that if the owner leaves a last will, the AI should do its best to fulfill it. She reveals that the cure data left behind by Dr. Dora is still in her memory disk and could be helpful. Hasty is surprised by this revelation, and Mamia asks if they would accompany her for a while. With a bright expression, Hasty agrees and assures Mamia that they will go together. Meanwhile, inside the Oz House head office in Sector AM0, Crocker and Catherine are viewing a recording of Mamia and Hasty's fight. Crocker informs Catherine that it appears to be some sort of computer virus. Catherine inquires further about the virus, and Crocker explains that he needs to analyze the AI to be certain. He assumes that the custom OS installed in the household AI had overtaken the Medicalroids OS and forcibly replaced it with an identical one. He also believes that until the situation improves, restoring their OS is impossible. However, he suspects that there may be a hidden code being executed under special conditions. Catherine expresses confusion, questioning how a mere software change could result in such a phenomenal transformation. Crocker acknowledges the possibility, shocking Catherine, and proceeds to explain the method. He reminds her that as the commander, it is her responsibility to resolve this situation and warns her not to reveal the information he is about to disclose. He emphasizes that it has been designated by the president as equivalent to the Venus Project. Finally, he reveals that all AI produced by Oz House, including household, industrial, medical, and even the super soldier AI, have identical hardware specifications. Catherine's face fills with shock as she tries to comprehend what Crocker is telling her. With a stressed expression, she asks him to explain further, specifically about the similarity between military and household AI hardware. 
Crocker reveals that when OZ House advertises its products, they emphasize the ability to operate the AI with solar power for 24 hours, claiming there is no need for charging. However, this is far from the truth as a simple solar battery cannot efficiently produce energy. Catherine listens intently, her curiosity peaked and asks what the true nature of the energy core is. Crocker's response leaves her astounded. He explains that the energy core is an infinite energy generator capable of producing and amplifying energy indefinitely. It defies the first law of thermodynamics and challenges common knowledge. The amount of energy it can generate is so vast that its limits are difficult to estimate. The output is controlled by the installed OS, tailored to each AI's usage. Crocker's revelation shocks Catherine even more, and she finds it absurd that such a groundbreaking discovery was kept hidden until now. She questions Crocker's motives for utilizing this power generator solely on AI. Crocker informs her that before the infinite energy generator was used, OZ House conducted tests in an environment resembling humans. He speculates about the motives behind this decision, leading Catherine to wonder why he is speculating instead of having first-hand knowledge as the company owner. Crocker explains that he is merely a figurehead, and in reality, OZ House is a state-operated enterprise. His role is limited to company management and software-related matters. Catherine is bewildered by this revelation, but Crocker goes on to explain that the government, responsible for AI production, easily breaches human privacy. To avoid negative perceptions from citizens tired of the Third Empire's dictatorship, they disguise the OZ House as a privately owned enterprise. Even Crocker himself doesn't know when the infinite energy generator was invented or the production process. The first half of AI production occurs in Sector PA001, a location affiliated with the President and managed by the Counterintelligence Corps. Crocker is also prohibited from entering this highly secure facility. Catherine, absorbing this information, is told that heavy security measures are in place to prevent situations like the current one. Crocker warns that if left unchecked, the household AI could revolt against humanity, considering that each AI is equivalent to a super-soldier. Catherine reflects on the absurdity of the master-servant relationship between humans and AI. She stands up, expressing her gratitude to Crocker for sharing this information, and promises to report the matter to the president. However, before leaving, she poses one more question about the creator of the AI's OS, hoping that Crocker may have some insight. In a jet, Catherine ponders the weight of her conversation with Crocker, leaving the officer curious about its gravity. Catherine instructs him to contact headquarters and arrange for the command ship's departure directly to the presidential palace. They urgently need to meet the president. The secretary expresses concern about the timing since considering recent events where they just lost Skarnhorst and shot two Musfelheims without permission so they need to report about it but asks if they really have to report in person knowing that the president will beat her up, but Catherine asserts that she will handle it and insists on contacting headquarters. She realizes that the situation is more dire than she initially thought. Any misstep could escalate matters beyond the virus, requiring the president's permission to deploy super soldiers. Meanwhile, Crocker watches a video of Hasty and reflects on someone important. He is grateful for the current situation, believing that he can finally overcome the deep-seated sense of inferiority and frustration within him. He vows to surpass his teacher. We observe Mamea proudly showcasing a beautiful car to Hasty and Neville. She reveals that it belonged to Dora, and they used it for grocery runs. Both Hasty and Neville are amazed by their beauty. Hasty inquires about their destination, suggesting that now they have the data, they can create the cure. Mamea remains silent for a moment, but Hasty turns to Neville and asks him for input. Mamea finally apologizes and admits that she lacks the ability to analyze the data, surprising Hasty. She explains that it's not an AI limitation, but rather a law imposed by humans. Mamea takes a seat in the car and reveals that medical droids are intentionally designed not to perform better than human doctors. The likely reason behind this is to prevent the loss of professionals in the medical industry. However, the truth is that humanity still cannot fully trust AI with their lives. As Hasty places Neville in the car, she suggests finding another doctor. But Mamea mentions that before her death, Dora mentioned someone who would help them inherit the data of Martin Husson. Mamea reveals that she has seen him working alongside Dora's pupil on several occasions. Describing him as an eccentric and messy person who was always engrossed in old paper books, Mamea believes that Dora trusted his skills, hence choosing him as her inheritor. They set off, and Hasty confirms if they are indeed heading to see Martin. 
Mamea confirms and adds that their journey won't be easy since he works at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in Sector EU0. Hasty realizes that Sector EU0 is the capital of the EU and is located 2,875 kilometers away from their current location, making it extremely far. Mamea explains that distance is not their only obstacle. With Neville in tow, they will face numerous difficulties because Sector EU0 is a non-infectious residential area where humans reside. While driving, Hasty suggests dropping the honorifics between them as they are fellow AIs, and friends don't use honorifics with each other. Mamea is momentarily confused by the concept of friendship among AIs, but Hasty apologizes for bringing up a pointless topic. However, Mamea agrees that they should drop the honorifics, realizing it's not a bad feeling, allowing Hasty to comfortably communicate with her. Hasty's joy is evident, and she celebrates with Neville, finally thrilled to have a friend. Suddenly, Mamea spots someone on the roadside holding a cardboard sign asking for a ride. Startled, Hasty notices that the person is also an AI. Mamea confirms that she is a household AI like herself, with the model number MD6743, stating that she is the latest household AI released in March of the previous year. As they approach her in the car, Mamea chooses to drive away, ignoring the hitchhiking AI. She tells Hasty that they have a long way to go and no obligation to help other AIs. Mamea finds it suspicious because the hitchhiker is disobeying AI law, specifically Article 8, Clause 2, which requires AIs to wear their designated outfits according to their purpose. However, Hasty believes they should listen to the hitchhiker's story. Right at that moment, a hook attaches to the back of their car, and they realize that the hitchhiking AI has thrown it. She holds onto the rope connected to the hook and pleads with them, stating that fellow AIs should help each other and questioning whether they feel satisfied ignoring her. She calls Mamia a heartless eye patch thing which annoys her and she starts to steer the car all around the road, causing the hitchhiker to be dragged along the road, desperately holding onto the rope. Finally, they arrive at an abandoned building, where Mamea reluctantly agrees to listen to the hitchhiker's story. She asks for her name and her purpose. The hitchhiker, looking at her torn shoe, laments its condition and introduces herself as Kyra. Mamea questions her about her owner and why she is traveling alone. Kyra explains that she has been searching for her owner everywhere. Mamea presses further, inquiring about her business with them. Kyra reveals that she wants to ask them for a ride to the industrial zone in Sector F6. Mamea examines the map and informs her that they cannot help since their destination is in the east, while hers is in the west. She states that it's too far out of their way and that they cannot provide her with a ride. Mamea prepares to leave, taking Hasty and Neville towards the car. However, Kyra comments on Mamea's coldness and curiosity, asking why they are heading to a non-infectious region with a creature. Mamea retorts that they don't need to disclose their reasons. Kyra persists, claiming that Mamea must have been betrayed by someone else, implying that it's the reason she acts the way she does toward others. Mamea angrily warns her to be careful with her words, but Kyra laughs and suggests that her assumption must be true since Mamea reacted strongly. Kyra offers some advice, stating that it's unwise to enter a non-infectious region without preparation. She points to Neville, asserting that he would perish within three seconds in the non-infectious region. Hasty expresses curiosity about what the non-infectious region is like, and Kyra mentions that she passed by it 17 days ago. Suddenly, an attack helicopter appears, sensing a creature among them. Surprised, they see a soldieroid airplane. Kyra seems delighted and declares that she can now show the eye-patched girl how impressive her abilities are. She instructs everyone to step back, hands them her bag, and assures them that she will handle everything. As the soldieroid airplane prepares to attack, Kyra mentions that she can handle a tin can like it with just one finger. What lies ahead for them as they venture into this mystical world? What do you think will happen next? Don't forget to hit the like button, comment if you want to continue this series and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching.